Hello, I'm Norman Swan. Welcome to this Parliamentary Friends of Palliative Care, our December event. Um, we've had several events this year so far, this time of COVID. And in fact, today's program is about the impact of COVID-19 on the delivery of palliative care services. Look at what we've learned and how we might build moving forward, not just for pandemics, but in general, because the health system as a whole has been extremely stressed by this last time, but not least uh, palliative care. And these issues also have been addressed by the Australian COVID-19 Palliative Care Working Group. Um, I'm speaking to you from uh, the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, um, and I'd like to pay my respects to those traditional owners of the land and to elders, uh, past, present, and future. Um, I'd also like to pay respect because there's many people watching this from around Australia to the land on which, the traditional lands on which you are finding yourself watching this from. And, um, and it's not a trivial exercise paying respects to the elders at this time of COVID-19. Elders uh, in Aboriginal community, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities around Australia have really stepped to the fore in leadership of their communities, which is reflected on the lack of COVID-19 in those communities. That doesn't mean to say it hasn't been tough with lockdowns, but it's been a triumph of community control and the leadership by elders. Um, and to start, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, uh, Senator Katrina Bellick and Nola Marino, who are um, co-conveners of the Parliamentary Friends of, uh, the, the, by the, of the Parliamentary Friends of Palliative Care Group. Hello, I'm Senator Katrina Bellick, Senator for Tasmania, co-convener of the Parliamentary Friends of Palliative Care Group with Mrs. Nola Marino. And I'd like to welcome you all to this Parliamentary Friendship Group event and thank you all for your attendance. While the world is focused on COVID-19, we mustn't forget the importance of palliative care. While we prepare for a good birth, I think it's equally important that we must, where we can, also prepare for a good death. It's vital that information regarding palliative care is available to all who need it and that awareness of palliative care becomes much more widespread. Today's event is part of that process. And I'd like to pass on my thanks to all our speakers for today and for everyone that's taking part. Hello, everyone. I'm really pleased to really welcome you all to this Parliamentary Friends of Palliative Care event. Wherever you are in Australia, thank you so much for being part of this today. I'm the co-convener, I'm Nola Marino from the southwest of Western Australia, the member for Forest. And the group, as you know, is very important to provide access to members of parliament right across the parliament itself to be able to take part and listen and learn more about palliative care. Now, we all understand how important palliative care is, and each one of us has our own experiences in this space. In my particular area in regional Australia, I understand very much how important good palliative care is and the availability of palliative care. For our speakers today, thank you so much again for being part of this and helping to make sure that all of us understand more and more about the importance of palliative care. And thank you to everyone who's part of this today. Uh, Katrina and I really, really appreciate your presence. Thank you. Earlier this week, Dr. Will Cairns and uh, Rachel Coughlin we're discussing the uh, scope of challenges that a pandemic or disaster poses for the delivery of health services, in particular for palliative care. Um, Will Cairns is well known as a palliative medicine consultant in Queensland, and Rachel is a public health professional with experience in clinical practice. Let's have a look at that conversation. Thanks, Norman. I think it's fair to say that the palliative care community was not unprepared for the emergence of this pandemic. Some of us have actually been thinking about the role of palliative care and disaster management for some time, and there is a significant global literature on the topic. For Australian and New Zealand palliative care, our wake-up call came with the Christchurch earthquake, which had a significant and prolonged effect on their palliative care services. And the Society of Palliative Medicine actually devoted a session to disasters at our 2012 conference in New Zealand. So even before the dawn of 2020, we knew that disasters come in all shapes and sizes and with a complexity that cannot be predicted. That palliative care is a vital component of the response to any disaster that causes mass casualties. 
but that our role will only be, re be revealed as the nature of the disaster unfolds. Our biggest challenge is to maintain continuity of palliative care to existing and new patients. This meant that we paid attention when in January we first heard about the coronavirus. And in mid-February, we started to get organized. We contacted the leaders of the peak palliative care organizations and clinicians in every state and territory. And we found that many of them were already developing their local role in Australia's response. We all came together under the leadership of Palliative Care Australia because we needed to speak with a single voice to provide a source of accurate and credible information for our colleagues and our governments, and also to provide effective national advocacy. At the beginning of March, we formed the Australian COVID-19 Palliative Care Working Group. It was comprised of representatives of the peak organisations in states and territories, the Australian Department of Health, and a number of individuals with particular skills and knowledge. And we also started a newsletter as a means of communication. The working group identified a number of tasks. The first was to ensure continuity of care for existing palliative care patients. We also needed to understand the role of palliative care in managing patients dying from COVID-19. And the Society of Palliative uh, medicine and Palliative Care Nurses Australia took on the creation of palliative care gu guidelines for inclusion in the National COVID-19 Clinical Evidence Task Force database. We sought to understand the impact of disruption across our hospitals, communities and the residential aged care facilities. We worked with the Department of Health to ensure availability of essential drugs and equipment for palliative care. We promoted early advanced care planning to ensure that patient choices are documented. And we prepared for an expected increase in loss and grief due to the pandemic and the issues caused by the need for PPE and physical distancing. We also sought to address the issues of clinician burnout and moral distress in the face of COVID-19. In some cases, this was exacerbated by a lack of ethical guidance. And at the request of uh, the working group, Rachel Coglin, our next speaker who will be talking about ethical issues, she and I wrote a discussion paper on the ethical issues of COVID-19. So what did we learn about COVID-19 from the experience around the world and in Australia? First of all, the palliative care may need to be introduced even while life prolonging measures are underway. And in the UK and the US, concurrent palliative care rather than sequential care became quite common. We also learned that advanced care planning is vital and that we must accept that patient choices or clinical realities may determine the ceilings of care. However, PP hinders the communication that is necessary for candid and open conversations. We also learned that clinicians need prior support for their, from their governments for the triage decisions that they may be asked to make and that the complexity of modern societies has made the flow on effects of the pandemic um, very wide and very varied. We've also found that clinicians, patients and their families have been wonderfully resilient and innovative in the face of great challenges. As Australians, we've learned that our individual behaviour has determined the outcomes. Few of us have actually agreed with a woman in Bunnings. We found that we and our governments are very good at cooperating and collaborating in times of stress. However, interestingly, our governments have also been very wary of engaging with their communities in open discussion of how to make triage decisions. So where to once the pandemic is over? We need to follow up those who missed out over the course of the pandemic. We need to undertake research into the clinical and systemic outcomes. Were the concerns that we raised early on actually realized? For example, is there actually an increased burden of prolonged grief? We need an open review of how we responded across the community of palliative care. And we must also acknowledge our successes as a community. So finally, my question for you to contemplate on is, how do we prepare for the next disaster, given that we cannot know what form it will take? So thank you very much. And I'd now like to hand over to Rachel. Thanks very much, Will. So ethical dilemmas and difficult decision-making in humanitarian contexts such as armed conflict, natural disaster and disease epidemics are defining features of humanitarian health response. Frontline healthcare workers 
operating in these settings are all too familiar with the need to make intimate life and death decisions when resources are scarce or when resources may be overwhelmed by illness or injury. And that means prioritisation and triage. And it might often mean also choosing one life over another. But how does a health worker choose who to prioritise with limited resources? How do you successfully argue for the provision of palliative care for a dying patient when there are so many patients who might be requiring life-saving care or when even basic essentials such as food and shelter may be hard to come by? Will those choices determine who lives and who dies? And how do healthcare workers continue to make such decisions during public health emergencies without experiencing moral burnout? These moral challenges of prioritisation are extremely painful in a context where resources may be severely limited. New York Times journalist Sherry Fink, who's written a lot about the impacts of COVID-19 in America, said when she was experiencing the former Yugoslavian war, an impossible piece of human business, rationing, triage, whatever you call it, it is an inhuman act which humans are trying to do but the fact of their humanity makes it impossible. What we have here is a real problem. We have a God role and nobody fits it. These hellish choices, as described by my colleague, uh, humanitarian Hugo Slim, can cause moral distress for health workers. And in extreme cases, this kind of distress and a lack of clear decision-making protocols may even cause well-meaning health professionals to act in desperation to relieve suffering. And the example of the physician and the nurses charged but then later acquitted with euthanizing the most vulnerable patients in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina is an oft-cited example. COVID-19 has now shown the world that no context is immune from having to think about how we might respond to such hellish choices. Triage amidst armed conflict or disaster or disease epidemic is generally, follow, generally follows a utilitarian ethics to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people with the best use of resources. And while this kind of disaster or pandemic triage may make rational sense, it's completely counter to normative clinical ethics to ensure that each individual patient receives the best care possible and it's also counter to the motives of health workers or humanitarian actors who are driven by compassionate responses to individual human suffering. This balancing act between the best use of resources whilst respecting the values of each individual human life is at the core of the ethical tension in humanitarian and pandemic triage. It's also the reason why so many guidance documents around the world discuss ethical principles such as stewardship or duty of care, but then stop short of developing specific tools or protocols for decision-making. Several Australian medical policies on the topic set out that doctors are responsible for allocating scarce resources, but then they largely fail to address that more difficult question of how to implement this guidance when individual patient interests may conflict with the interests of the whole population. Clear decision-making protocols are needed to help health professionals to balance their ethical duties. So how should we develop such protocols? Will's already touched on some of these points, but I think there are three key areas to work on to recap. Firstly, we need government leadership and we need transparency and accountability. Our governments and policymakers have a duty to ensure the creation of triage protocols and to take responsibility for decision-making criteria and for the consequences of their implementation, both in practice and in law. Secondly, we need an open and honest public discussion with communities. Triage is a tough, necessary choice and the participation of the communities who will be affected by such decisions is paramount. Community engagement and participation has long been a pillar of public health programming. Communities themselves can identify solutions which will work best for them, and they're more likely going to be on board with tough moral decisions, no matter how painful 
if they've been part of developing them. In Maryland, for example, in the, after, in the shadow of Hurricane Katrina's tragedies, a series of public engagement forums were held to gather public views on questions of resource allocation should such heartbreaking decisions ever need to be made. And Dr Doherty Bitterson, who led the forum, said, I don't ever want to be in a position of making those decisions without knowing what you think. And finally, the third point, the tragedy of triage and tough decisions needs to be mitigated by compassionate palliative care. Interpretation of that utilitarian maxim, the greatest good for the greatest number, as most lives saved, needs ethical refinement. Any decision-making protocol must include the expectation that all patients will continue to receive the best available care even when curative treatment can't be provided. Palliative care is an imperative of triage categorisation. There will be more epidemics and pandemics beyond COVID-19. And when it comes to engaging communities in ethical debate and in developing pandemic triage protocol, we can't afford to wait until the next time. As Will said, that may be too late. We need to be having those conversations and we need to be developing those tools now. Thank you and back to you, Norman. And thanks to uh, Will Cairns and Rachel Coughlin. With me in the studio is Mira Agar, Professor Mira Agar, who's Professor of Palliative Care at the University of Technology, Sydney, and is in practice in palliative medicine in southwest Sydney. Welcome, and also Chair of Palliative Care Australia. Thanks again for joining us, Mira. Now, you, today you're going to launch uh, a, 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 almost like a white paper from Palliative Care Australia on bereavement and mental health issues. Just explain what's in it. Yeah, so very early on during our discussions around the, the response uh, from palliative care in terms of COVID-19, we identified loss, grief and, and bereavement as a really critical issue. And one of the things that we did was bring together a group of people who work in palliative care, bereavement, uh, primary care um, and also mental health to actually try and work out where the synergies were and what a coordinated response and what the needs were. And so we brought together that really wealth of discussion to map out what is going to be needed to address the issues of loss and, and bereavement, which I think have touched the lives of most, if um, not all, Australians. And what were your headline conclusion? Well, one of the things is that we really need a palliative care um, model of care, primary care and mental health services that are uh, able um, in normal times to address the issues of people who have had a bereavement and that it shouldn't be time limited that some of the issues around bereavement occur many um, months to years after the, the loss of um, someone. Um, really, I think we need a, a whole of um, sector approach to bereavement care and a strategy both at um, the Commonwealth and also at um, state and territory level. And we start, need to start having conversations between mental health primary care and palliative care and community-based services uh, to really optimise um, our response to people who are bereaved. So we, we were too hooked on Kubler-Ross thinking we're going to go through these planned stages of bereavement and you can go through all the stages in a single day or none at all for a while and then it happens six or eight months or even a year later. And our services are focused on the, you know, rightly so, on the individual who has the palliative diagnosis, but then you know, the, the person who is bereaved or the people who are bereaved become almost invisible to health services and we need a way of identifying them as the ongoing person who requires care going forward. So there is a risk in that, which is that you, you can medicalise bereavement. It's a normal reaction to somebody. You know, it's, a, it's a terrible reaction, but it's a normal reaction to somebody to losing somebody. And often, you know, GPs overprescribe antidepressants, thinking that's going to be the answer when you're really medicalizing a, a normal reaction. Is it? Is, is there a risk that you go out and look for people too hard and force them, in, if you like, into bereavement counselling rather than waiting for them to come forward? And how do you get that balance so that if they do come forward, you're ready for action? And that's why I think education, training and an awareness that grief is a, a normal response and what normal looks like, but also recognising the, the wealth of community and really local um, ways that people are supported through bereavement and helping people know what those services might be and those community supports that um, rally around people and um, encouraging people that those are really helpful, normal things to be reaching out for.
So rather than plan for a one in a hundred year pandemic, you've got to get the foundations right. Correct. We'll come back to those discussions in a minute. Also joining us is uh, Professor Michael Kidd, who's Deputy Chief Medical Officer and, primary and Principal Medical Advisor to the Department of Health and Aging in Canberra. He's also a Professor of Primary uh, Care Reform at the, at the Australian National University. Prior to that, he came back from Toronto, where he was uh, Chair of the Family Medicine Program at the University of Toronto. Welcome back to the, this palliative care program, Michael. Thank you, Norman. Uh, it's a privilege to uh, be back for this event. Now, this is a subject close to your heart, palliative care in primary health care. Um, you, you know, what do you think you've learned from the COVID-19 experience that applies to this moving forward, you know, particularly reflecting on some of the things that Mira has been saying? Well, firstly, can I just say a thank you to the parliamentary friends, but also to the healthcare providers right across the country who've stepped up during the COVID-19 pandemic, the doctors, nurses, allied health workers, Aboriginal health workers, uh, the people working in aged care, and also the family members and uh, loved ones who've been working as carers uh, or supporting their loved ones as carers uh, during the pandemic. This has been a really challenging time for all aspects of our healthcare system, but especially for palliative care. Right at the start of the pandemic, the Australian government recognised that we needed to be making sure that we we're able to support the most vulnerable people uh, in our community. And of course, that includes uh, people at the end of their life, uh, people requiring um, care and, and the dignity uh, of, uh, of care at the, uh, at the end of their lives. And, uh, and also recognising that regular healthcare services had to be able to continue uh, throughout the pandemic. And of course, we saw the introduction of uh, telehealth for the entire population uh, and that combination of using digital consultations with face-to-face -face consultations providing care to people. And I think this, is, this has opened up to us the opportunities uh, beyond COVID-19, whenever that occurs, uh, to be able to do things differently and do things better and to use this combination of, of digital health and face-to-face -face care uh, to provide improved access to care for everybody. So let's just start with telehealth moving forward and integrating that into palliative care. Um, I mean, people have talked about the telephone being you know, the, the primary tool, but I don't think the Commonwealth or even many doctors see it as a primary tool. Uh, so certainly what we've seen with the introduction of, of telehealth for the whole of the population is the majority of consultations have been by telephone, but increasingly we're seeing more and more use of video consultations. Now, the use of telehealth, of course, is not something that just appeared uh, with the pandemic. We've been using telehealth in Australia for over 20 years and including uh, in providing uh, palliative care services in some parts of the country. And particularly if you're reaching out uh, to people who are dying, if you're reaching out and providing care and support to loved ones, very often it's the, the video uh, usage which is going to provide uh, much more richness uh, to the consultations uh, both ends, both for the healthcare provider but also for the people receiving the care. Now, what about the, 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 you know, the involvement of general practice? So a lot of general practitioners like palliative care and get involved, but there's, there's really been a, a failure of involvement systemically with general practice, partly because the remuneration is not there. So if they do it, they do it out of a sense of love rather than being rewarded for it. How are things, and there's a whole agenda of primary care reform, how is it going to be made easier for those GPs who would quite like to do more palliative care to actually do it? Well, certainly, as, as you rightly say, palliative care is a core component of general practice, providing care for people throughout the lifespan, including at the end of life. And, uh, and the rewards, of course, are not just financial rewards, Norman. There are uh, great rewards in personal and professional satisfaction in providing excellent care and support uh, to people who are dying uh, and to their loved ones. Uh, the, uh, the ability now to utilise this combination of uh, telehealth with face-to-face -face consultations, I think is going to transform a lot of the care that we provide. And we're already seeing this with the um, ability for telehealth using video to open up 
uh, people's homes and, if you like, virtual home visits to people. And, of course, this extends to palliative care as well. We've also seen a real focus on the provision of care to the residents of aged care facilities during the pandemic and, uh, and a recognition of the importance of integrating the care provided by GPs and by other uh, primary care providers. Uh, to people in aged care, including people uh, at the end of their lives. So I think this is going to be a really important component uh, of our ongoing primary care reforms uh, over the next few years as we look to see what healthcare looks like uh, post-pandemic. So aged care and palliative care and chronic care in general, it's no longer the, you know, the, the, the single-handed GP who can manage that. It's a, it's a team sport. Sport's the wrong word, but you know what I mean. You have to do it in teams. How, and it's not been easy, you know, the structure of our system does not easily allow, even for GPs who are willing and able, to, to actually integrate into teams. What's going to, what are going to be the facilitators of team-based care involving general practice and primary health care? Well, certainly over, again, over the last few decades, we've seen a great growth in team-based care in general practice with the amalgamation of small practices into large practices, the incentives which have been, have been provided to allow uh, for support for the employment of a wider uh, healthcare team with general practice nurses, nurse practitioners, allied health professionals, uh, and others uh, being part of the primary care team, uh, working with local GPs to provide much more uh, comprehensive uh, care to, as you say, people with uh, complex chronic conditions and people uh, at the end of their lives. Uh, again, the telehealth arrangements allow us to expand uh, some of that with the ability uh, to use uh, digital technology to bring members of the team uh, together with the patient and with their uh, family members uh, in ways that we haven't been able to do before. And, uh, and I think, again, this is going to help to uh, transform uh, some of the way that we deliver primary care you know, into the future. Mira, just reflecting on some of the things that uh, Michael's been talking about there, um, how, how does palliative care view that team-based care? I mean, you can, you, if you just look at the specialist physicians, specialist nurses, you're never going to have enough resources to deal with the needs of palliative care, particularly since what we talked about you know, a few weeks ago, which is that palliative care is a core, is core business of residential aged care facilities, and it's not at the moment, with a few exceptions. What's your policy strategy for integrating it, reflecting on what Michael just said? I think one of the things is to work on a needs-based um, uh, approach and then work out who the team is that you do have available and work out what the competencies are to, to be able to deliver that care. And I think we're quite good at being nimble in terms of but the... It, but are you talking about the, the patient's own GP or is it going to be a group of specialist GPs? You know, For example, in Queensland and Brisbane, we've got a group of GPs who are highly specialised in diabetes care um, and that's what they do. It's not necessarily the patient's own GP. How, how do you see that working? I think both models can work well. Um, you know, one of the things that we found is that if you have a particular role and that's made clear, you, know, you can quite easily engage GPs to dial in for a family case conference, for example, for that specific um, item and discussion. And sometimes I think it's about making the role clear and what the contribution is up front and giving people time to prepare and feel able to make that contribution. And I think there's levels of um, contribution and sometimes for the more complex um, needs, you will need someone with a more specialist um, interest. But I think um, we can work with GPs where that's not their sole area of um, interest or expertise and um, they make great contributions if we um, make their role really clear and explicit to them. Michael, I mean, state, just, just on electronic health records, state -based, you know, palliative care is often a state-based service with their own records. You've, um, through the Commonwealth, made an enormous investment in my health record. Is it up to the task to being the coordinating record of palliative care or are we going to be running two different electronic records here? Well, I think, again, uh, during the pandemic, we've seen a, a real uh, increase in the utilisation of uh, my health record uh, with uh, a very significant increase in the number of 
um, reports and records are being uh, being stored there, but also a very significant increase in the number of accesses uh, by healthcare providers and also by individual health consumers themselves uh, looking at uh, at the content of my health record. So I think it's still a work in progress, but a very important. Um, uh, piece of infrastructure for our future healthcare system. We know that uh, communication is absolutely essential, that we are uh, communicating information in a timely manner between healthcare providers to optimise the, the quality of the care which is being provided. It uh, doesn't mean, of course, that we don't still need uh, communication in more old-fashioned ways, uh, talking to, uh, to uh, other providers who are providing care to a patient using the phone or uh, video consultations as well is still really important. Thanks, Michael. Also with us is uh, Mark Bowie, Associate Professor Mark Bowie, who's Director of Palliative Medicine at St Vincent's Hospital and uh, Co-Deputy -di co Director of the Centre for Palliative Care there, and is also Chair and Clinical Lead of Saver Care Victoria's Palliative Care Clinical Network. Welcome to the programme, Mark. Thank you, Norman. Now, Victoria's had its hand in the fire um, over the last three or four months, four months. Um, what have we learned? Well, I think in, in many ways, Norman, um, from a palliative care perspective, the response has provided uh, a significant opportunity to enhance the role and reach of palliative care, particularly I've seen across our health service in terms of being at the front line, in terms of clinical decision making, kind of um, implementing sort of ethics of care discussions, trying to help uh, clinical staff understand the sort of significant variation that changes in um, uh, chief health officer directions can make an impact on patients, families and staff. And that's certainly been my experience in a, in a health service hospital system. But I think as you move out into the community, palliative care has certainly obviously provided more and more care in the community. I think there's been an average in Victoria about 40% increase in deaths at home. Now that looks great on the surface, but then health services or the community palliative care services haven't necessarily been able to, um, to, to sort of keep up with the amount of support that's required. And certainly there is sort of early evidence in that sort of disconnection just through telehealth and less physical connection that maybe there are significant impacts occurring on families and the bereaved and so forth in terms, but that's in early stages. I think that's really been highlighted in the paucity of issues of providing palliative care into residential aged care and the issues that have really exploded with the residential aged care issues that played out. And in terms of, um, again, underdevelopment of palliative care was already there as highlighted within the so Royal Commission into Aged Care. And so only that was amplified during our time. But I think particularly when you get to the borders, I think it was even amplified even more between, say, the New South Wales, Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland borders, where I would sum it up in three words of dislocation, disenfranchisement and moral distress. And I think that plays out for patients, families, clinicians and services where they really have, were forced to make choices between does a patient go to a hospital to have care and be disenfranchised from their family or does they stay with the family and disenfranchise themselves from the care that they might need? So I think it really played out uh, as, as things moved on to that border closure. So those are, those are the problems, but necessity, to use a cliche, is the mother of invention. What models or responses did you see that you think, well, that's a great example that could spread beyond covid to be really good for palliative care service? If we take our focus back to the sort of aged care response, and even though it was sort of changing and moving in action, I think the clustering of and hubbing of uh, health services, private and public together, as well as the engagement of primary health networks in that mix is a significant step forward. And hopefully that does translate into ongoing uh, national uh, change and practice. And I do think the initial discussions now for any future residential aged care responses or responses into disability will be able to demonstrate that maybe this hub modelling of healthcare services will actually have a significant impact into the future and trying to overcome not only the clinical issues and barriers at play but overcome the state commonwealth 
barriers that can sometimes present in the way care is delivered. So, I mean, that, that, was a, you know, that was reflected in the national response to COVID. And Michael was heavily involved in the GP respiratory clinics and you saw uh, and, and, and private practice being brought much more into the fold with public services. Um, but in a sense, that broke the rules or the unspoken rules. How can you sustain that beyond COVID-19 when there isn't a sense of emergency driving people forward? I think one of the mechanisms um, which I'm involved with, say, for Care Victoria and certainly being in the clinical leadership expert working group and advocating and being part of that, I think the sort of work where they can continue to, uh, I guess, in some ways, keep health services and keep government accountable to be making sure that these problem areas that ro rose up during the pandemic aren't always going to be those problem areas into the future. And it is through that sort of ongoing sort of advocacy and continual improvement, I think, that maybe we're able to sustain the differences. There still seems to be the energy there at the moment, and I think the people have seen the consequences of not having those connections readily available and made. That means that then you end up having to work through the two sides of bureaucracy to come to some agreement. It really delays the clinical response, and so I think hopefully we've learned a lot through that sort of process. <laughs> Mira, this is the Parliamentary Friends broadcast that we're talking about, so hopefully we're talking to some parliamentarians, particularly in Canberra. Um, what do you think the role of the Commonwealth here is in trying to bring this together in our, you know, it's nobody's fault, it's just the way the system was designed, but it's not designed easily to make this sort of thing happen that Mark's talking about? Well, I think one of the things that we really feel is important is that we need someone that has some oversight of the National Palliative Care strategy and its implementation and actually looking at where the pressure points between different states and the border issue is one example where we need to think about what the palliative care system in each side looks like and how it can work in those uh, regions. But also I think the aged care and community side of things is really where Commonwealth contribution to, to healthcare and state-based services really need some integration. And I think those are the but two But it's more than money. It's not just, that's not just money. It's about thinking about what the optimal system looks like and some coordination and some direction that these um, integration of these elements need to occur. So, Mark, I mean, one of the, another feature of the COVID-19 was variation in care, unacceptable variation. Some people kindly call it unexplained variation. And there, there is that variation in palliative care within cities and between cities and the country. And uh, you, you, you know, people do not get the same standard of palliative care regardless of where they are. Um, how do we solve those? Because one, one of the other problems with variation is that some jurisdictions thought they had the best health service, and it turns out that they didn't, um, which requires major reform. How do you deal with um, the, the, this parochialism which believes we've got the best system, um, you know, get back into your patch? Well, I think, look, I think increasingly people are trying to rely on evidence to demonstrate practice and what elements of care delivery and how it's being delivered are actually impacting for the patient and the family. And obviously, going forward, I think, you know, the, the um, enhancement of, of telehealth, um, I think, and, and so forth, the connecting to people and reaching to people's homes in various modalities will start to see, I think the evidence will suggest that maybe people are feeling more connected, even if not every visit is going to be a physical face-to-face, -face, it's going to be a sort of a collective grouping of things. I think that will make a difference. But I think the evidence, it's really trying to get a good evidence base for palliative care, getting the data um, across the system. Do you think there are enough measures of patient experience and client experience to be able to feed back into the system if you've got truly... I mean, there should be almost no specialty, apart from perhaps aged care, which is more patient and family centred. Yeah. Look, I, I think, unfortunately, again, the evidence, um, even though we have national registry and that's strong part of the sector, but, again, we don't have consistency across the country for a lot of the data bases. In Victoria, you know, we've been looking at the evidence with palliative care in mind, and it really is an area that doesn't have as much as it has to provide to demonstrate what are the impacts of these things? Having said that, though, I think, again, in places like the pandemic, regional 
rural and remote can often come up with more innovative ideas in connecting the pieces together. And we see that play out, say, with the paramedics and ambulance uh, Victorian stations in the rural. They actually provide a quite an extensive support network for patients in rural regional communities, which doesn't exist in metro services and so forth. So I do think there are local unique things that could be sort of looked at and scaled across the system. So we shouldn't always be looking to metro, but we should be looking across the system to see what can be utilised to enhance. I might get a quick comment from Michael Kidd before moving on. Michael, how, what incentives or systems can the Commonwealth or should the Commonwealth put in place to actually force this policy issue that, because you know, even it's partly my fault by asking the question, my, my questions are all provider centric rather than patient centric, but really to drive consistency of care, it's got to be patient centric. So that means you've got to have measures, you've got to have feedback loops, you've got to have performance, ma ma you know, performance managed. And there is an important role for the Commonwealth as an important funder in this area. What, what's your thinking along those lines? Well, certainly part of the, the global health movement is towards delivering healthcare and having healthcare systems which are much more person-centred rather than centred on the needs of the system or, or on the providers uh, of care. Uh, what we've, we've seen during the pandemic, though, is an unparalleled level of um, collaboration uh, between the Commonwealth and the states and territories in a number of really important areas. We've seen a lot more integration, for example, of primary care and public health uh, as a necessity in order to uh, tackle COVID-19 and make sure that we're protecting the population. We've seen uh, a lot more uh, integration with uh, with a lot of the services which have been provided while we've been uh, in lockdown and the need for people to be working closely together to ensure that the population is getting access to the healthcare services that they need. So I think it's going to be very difficult to backpedal on some of this movement uh, that we've seen happening, but there's still, uh, there's still a long way to go. Uh, I've been really impressed with how in some of the states and territories there's been embracing of the Commonwealth-funded uh, primary uh, health networks, there's been integration with Commonwealth-funded uh, GP-led uh, respiratory clinics integrating with the state-funded uh, fever clinics. So there's a number of examples which, uh, which have arisen out of necessity, and I hope we'll see uh, a lot of that continue into the future. But what about forcing people to actually report on patient measures rather than, that's still quite provider-centric, it's all great news, but it's still very provider-centric. Well, certainly in primary care in Australia, we've had increasing again over a number of years, uh, blended payments with payments related to uh, delivering uh, certain services to meet uh, community needs. And uh, we've had introduced quite recently a number of, uh, of, of measures looking at uh, quality uh, indicators of, uh, of, indicators of uh, quality improvement in, in practice uh, and, uh, and in care delivery. And whether we'll see those uh, continue uh, to develop, I'm not yet sure, but certainly that's being looked at as part of the national primary care reforms. Thanks, Michael. I'd like to introduce also Janine Harlem, who is President of Palliative Care Nurses Australia. Janine, give us the nurses' perspective here as we hopefully go into a post-COVID environment um, facilitated by one of these vaccines that looks as if it might come, come on board quite soon. Hi, Norman. Um, great to be here. I think from the nurses' perspective, we've just successfully had our first virtual Palliative Care Nurses Australia conference, which has brought nurses together from all over the country. And there was a strong focus on COVID and post-pandemic and I think the, the lessons that we have taken from COVID, we, nurses will take forward into the future, and that's working with technology to support our patients. We have really worked hard at integration across the country, joining many state and territory networks to bring residential aged care nurses together with their partners in public and private. Um, we continued in community, nurses continued to be at the home, at the bedside for those patients and families that didn't want to come to hospital because of lack of visitation or um, only having one person that could be with them. And so there was a lot of um, 
um, a lot of patients that were scared to come to hospital. And so nurses kept going into homes. And I think one of the good things around those strategies was with the technology connection back to doctors, they still had that medical support to give them advice because for community nurses, there was a lot of other services withdrawing from homes and it was community nurses that were at the forefront of providing that care. So if you look, if you look forward then in terms of the, the, what you've learned to apply to a situation where th things could get better irrespective of COVID, but learnings that you've learned from it, let's just take three areas, which is um, you know, let's start with uh, hospital and inpatients. What, what needs to happen there, do you think? I think one of the things is that nurses really felt the withdrawal of volunteers from palliative care units and wards because they do provide programs that provide a lot more to patients and families at the bedside and also put petrol in the tank of the staff because there's music programs and things like that happening, arts programs. So I think what this showed us is the withdrawal of volunteers was predominantly because of their older person age group. And so a really good target for the future would be in trying to attract younger volunteers as a balance. So we could, um, if something happened in the future, we would still probably be able to have those volunteers contributing. I think the other thing for ward staff or in hospital staff um, was needing to deal with um, relatives and sometimes their distress and anger at not being able to come into the hospital. And so nurses obviously became very, very resilient at dealing with that type of conflict. But I think in the future, nurses would appreciate having models that actually look at who should be at the bedside at what time rather than just um, cutting visiting off altogether. Now, what the, the second setting to look at is the community, and community settings. From a nurse's point of view, what are the changes, what are the learnings from that? Yeah, I think in many states and territories, there's models where um, there's ambulance um, partnerships or ambulance plans. And I think in the pandemic, that proved to be really important, as did advanced care planning, so that community nurses were primary and specialist nurses were really clear around goals of care and being able to articulate that back to GPs and other service providers that may have been coming into the home. Um, I think in, in the home setting, it was really hard for nurses because you never know what's behind the door that you're going into. So risk assessments became really important and nurses had to learn skills very quickly in how to um, talk with families and, and get some traction around how many people could be there while the nurse was present because you were taking from the hospital setting where you may have 20 people normally around a patient, that was then happening in the home setting and they had to be well aware of their policies and procedures and then in the home setting, they also had to um, look at people that were wanting to come to the home to visit that were either in quarantine or trying to get exemptions from other states. And that proved a real challenge at times. It could be a slow process. It wasn't happening in a timely manner. So that was just an added, an added problem for them to be dealing with. I might just, uh, before we go on, uh, Janine, ask Mira and Mark whether they've noticed an uptick in advanced care plans being you know, put together since this time. Have we seen an acceleration of that or no difference? I think there's been the acceleration in people realising that it's an iterative conversation and rising to the challenge of having those difficult conversations and asking people whether they have one and whether um, they want to have that conversation. And I think... Now, Janine's point, it's about conversation and communication and that that's the skill set that every health professional needs to have. I think that would be my obser observation rather than the document and the, the plan per se. It's the skill and the conversation and the importance of that that I think people have realised is really, really critical. Mark? 
Look, I, I agree. I think even in, in our health services, even prior as the pandemic was getting going, uh, particularly into the residential aged care services in our community, we our teams were going out to start those conversations within residential aged care. But I've certainly noticed in the REBA for deployment of nursing staff during the pandemic that we've been able to push forward things like ACP um, ward champions. We've been able to actually really encourage the utilisation of advanced care planning in a much more systematic way than we could ever have done prior to in our health services. So finally, Janine, uh, let's look at residential aged care facilities and the experience of nurses and what do you think needs to move forward from there? A fraught area, commission you know, is going to report, certainly had a quick look, a relatively quick look at the COVID-19 impact, but um, you know, it really has declared the deficiencies in our aged care system. Yeah, and I think we've heard from nurses all across the country and I think they need to be applauded in residential aged care. They were the people that kept turning up to work, um, caring for people while there was lockdowns in facilities. And I think there's a lot to learn from those facilities that were severely affected by COVID into the future. Um, I think those nurses were looking for support and guidance and I think at times because it felt to them and they have said it felt like it happened overnight, they were getting mixed information from both um, Commonwealth, Departments of Health, local services and I think I've heard some really good stories where um, in some health services meetings and um, were, caught, were pulled together where it involved all the players and we hope those things will continue into the future, building those networks. I mean, it can be very isolating in aged care unless you're in a network. What are the structural things that could happen that allow nurses, particularly palliative care nurses, as they become integrated into aged care more profoundly than they have? What are the system, what are the system infrastructure things that can guarantee they get that rather than it being haphazard and dependent on local clinical leadership, which is sometimes left wanting. Yeah, so I think there needs to be a really strong communication strategy so that they feel confident where their information is coming from is the right information at the right time rather than being bombarded with things from every jurisdiction. I think building things like communities of practice and I think residential aged care facilities in particular I'm sure there will be many recommendations come out of the Royal Commission in the future, but in terms of their staffing, their ratios and the, um, the levels of nursing that they have is really key and fundamental to future care. Michael Kidd, I suppose primary health networks are part of this glue as well. Yes, absolutely. So uh, engaging uh, the primary health networks, making sure uh, particularly that, that local GPs, but also other primary care providers in the local community are well engaged uh, with their uh, local aged care facilities. Um, and, uh, and I like um, the, uh, the communities of practice. I think it's more than, than just the nurses. But I also want to do a huge shout out to those who have been working in, in our aged care facilities during the pandemic and who have uh, provided um, great care and service to the to the residents uh, they're looking after throughout the pandemic. And for those uh, watching this webinar, I refer you to the Palliative Care Australia's website because we did do a previous webinar on palliative care and integrating it into aged care, a very important part of the process moving forward, probably could have solved some of the problems in advance um, because you know, really making aged care facilities, health facilities, as well as people's homes, but that's another program. Liz Lobb, welcome to the, sh to the program. Professor Liz Lobb is Professor of Palliative Care and Deputy Chair of Calvary Palliative and End of Life Care Research Institute. Um, Liz, you've, you've had a particular interest in bereavement through this, which is one of the things that Mira was talking about at the beginning. Yes, thank you, Norman. I mean, we're certainly very aware how the COVID-19 pandemic has changed how we live, but it also has changed the way we die and the way we grieve. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that any death that's occurred during the pandemic, be it due to COVID or other causes, has occurred against a background of multiple losses. Uh, there's been, you know, loss, loss of employment, um, loss of trust, loss of plans for the future. Um, and many of, and whilst 
loss, grief is a normal response to loss, many of these things that have occurred during the pandemic can bring added risk factors towards bereavement. And we know under normal circumstances, so pre-COVID, that around 44,000 Australians um, suffer quite chronic and debilitating grief um, in the form of prolonged grief disorder. And many of the public health measures that were in place during COVID has the potential to increase this risk. Um, you know, for example, um, families were not able or were limited in being able to visit. Some facilities allowed two families to be present. We know in some ICU units and residential aged care uh, units that people weren't able to visit at all. And one of the difficulties here is that families were not able to be present. They were not able to bear witness to the death. They could not be advocates for the patient. Uh, they were not able to perhaps have the opportunity to say goodbye, to deal with unfinished business. And one of the concerns we have around bereavement is regret. And this raised not being present many questions. You know, did they die in pain? Did they die alone? Did they receive optimal care? And so also two families were reluctant to engage into their health system as we've heard. And perhaps conversations, particularly in palliative care around prognosis uh, were not held. And we know that lack of preparedness is one of the risk factors uh, for bereavement. Um, and what we've also seen too is that because of the limitations on visitation in hospitals, many families have opted for a home death. And this has brought many challenges. Like for example, in my own service, if we look at July last year, our average length of stay of a patient prior to death was around 14.5 days. In July this year, it was 4.5 days. And this brings real challenges for the staff. It means that patients are coming in and dying faster. There are challenges in getting to manage the symptoms, to get to know the families, to put pastoral care and psychosocial care into place. Um, it also too means when patients, um, families opted for a home death because of the limitation in, in visitation, that perhaps they were not prepared for this. Uh, whilst supports were brought in, often families will say, we, we didn't know that it would be this difficult particularly the process of dying for many people is very challenging. So, so we talk about long COVID um, for people who've actually been infected with the virus. I was going to experience a long tail of bereavement here, not just for people who had COVID, but people who died at a time of lockdown. Yes, exactly. And there's certainly some concerns being expressed um, from overseas that whilst the medical profession's been getting on top of the COVID curve, curve, we really now need to look at the bereavement curve and what we can do to address that. Um, because many of the risk factors that are associated with prolonged grief um, are also associated with these public health measures. Were we doing bereavement well enough beforehand? Or is this, I mean, is this just declared a weakness that was already in the system? Um, you know, palliative care is involved in people who are alive. And yes, they follow up with families afterwards, but they've only got limited capacity, your services, to deal with this in the long term. It's the GP who's going to follow through, but GPs are not necessarily well trained in this. We talked at the beginning of over-medicalizing bereavement. Um, there is evidence that GPs over-prescribe antidepressants rather than accepting this as a normal reaction, which people have to be talked through and supported. I mean, what challenges moving forward has this declared? I think one of the biggest challenges is that with the restrictions on public gathering, particularly around funerals, and we know that funerals are an important ritual, they're an important part of the grieving process, they bring communities together, they help people process the reality of the death. And you're right, you know, grief is a normal response to loss, and the majority of people will do well with community support. But what has happened during the pandemic is that that community support hasn't been there. People have been isolated. There's been limitations to the number of people that can come to funerals. People haven't been able to turn up with the cakes and the casseroles that they would normally do. So I, so I, I understand that. I'm just, sorry, I'm mm -hmm. conscious of time, but, 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 but the people then are, I mean, the implication of what you're saying is that there's incomplete grieving, people are still suffering and they're in distress. Um, and what, what's, what, what do we need to do? I mean, communities will start to come together very rapidly now in, in this recovery phase when we've got no spread. 
But what, 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 what are, what's the infrastructure of things that need to happen to reinforce a healthy bereavement support system in Australia? I think community awareness is very important. We're very reluctant to talk about death and dying. And so to be building communities of support around individuals, I think bereavement counsellors, we need to recognise that they form a specific role. And whilst grief is a normal response to loss, many people perhaps have become isolated. They don't have the networks that they would normally draw upon. If we're looking specifically at complications in grief, um, there are many programs and interventions that are available, but the challenge is that there are a lot of health professionals who are not trained in these. Um, I think we need to look at how we can make many of these available internet um, based on um, internet programs. There's evidence around those. I think there's a lack of training for many of the bereavement counsellors around the more complex aspects of bereavement. Um, and I think there's going to be a need going into the future to be much more um, available uh, many of the bereavement counselling sessions have been held on telehealth, which is not quite the same. Um, it's quite difficult to build that individual rapport that you would get in bereavement counselling. So going into the future, I think we need to focus our key thing on providing information to families. It's far better that, that individuals understand and can self-refer, but that we have a service there that's robust enough for those who want to seek out help and that we have the professionals who are trained to be able to identify that the COVID-19 pandemic brings specific risk factors and we need to screen for those, we need to be aware of those, and we need to be prepared to work with people through those issues. And they'll last for a while. Liz, thanks very much indeed. We're almost out of time, but I just want to ask one particular question from Stacey here at Myron Brigi uh, Primary Health Network, and she asks, is there modelling to demonstrate what's likely to be the increase in palliative care numbers and the assumption here is that people are having late cancer diagnoses because they haven't been turning up for screening or uh, symptom, check, symptom checks. Have we got any fix on that, Mira? So I know a number of the cancer services um, have been looking at new diagnoses and definitely there is evidence that the number of new diagnoses um, of, of cancer have um, dropped. And I think um, there are a number of groups that are monitoring um, those um, figures really um, closely. Mark, do you want to comment? Uh, look, I would agree. I know um, Victoria's taken a far systematic approach to this, and again, the evidence is certainly clearly showing that there has been that significant drop off of sort of early diagnosis and delayed diagnosis, and people presenting with a number of malignancies in stage three, four rather than one, two. And so, again, the impacts of that will continue, I guess, to play out in the system and a number of those sort of indirect impacts? Well, the, we've been lucky in Australia that our COVID-19 pandemic has been much less impactful, impactful though it has been, um, than other, many other countries. And as we go to air, um, many other countries around the world are suffering mightily from this. And we are very, very fortunate that we've got down to virtually zero spread and Adelaide will too very shortly. And, um, and that's made a big difference to us, but we've learned a lot and there is going to be a long tail, not just from people who've had COVID-19, but from the effects on the system, the effects on palliative care, but it's a huge opportunity. And I'd like you to join me in thanking all our panelists and Mira Agar, and thank you for, for joining us. And I'm going to now throw to Roland uh, Greenland, who's the CEO of Palliative Care Australia to close. Thank you. On behalf of our board chair, Professor Mira Agar, and the entire team at Palliative Care Australia, Thank you to everyone who has joined us today and contributed to the success of this, our final Parliamentary Friends of Palliative Care event for 2020. I extend a heartfelt thanks to you, Norman, our MC for today. Norman, this is in fact the fourth event you have conducted for us this year. The first was on the 10th of March, a face-to-face -face meeting in Melbourne, but at a time when your now famous Corona cast was still in their infancy. I think you slipped out to do what was then just your fourth Corona cast on that day. So thank you for your support and for keeping us on our toes as we have sought to pursue, examine and address critical issues related to the impact of COVID-19 on the delivery of palliative care during the past 10 months. Thank you too to our speakers, Dr. Will Cairns, Rachel Coughlin, uh, Professor Michael Kidd, Associate Professor Mark Bowie, Janine Harlem and Professor Liz Lobb. To our hosts, the co-chairs of the Parliamentary Friendship Group, Senator Katrina Bilk and the Honourable Nola Marino, we are grateful for your energy 
and dedication to the palliative care cause over many years. Together you have helped all of us highlight some of the critical challenges and hearings from the pandemic year and what can be done to not only better meet future emergencies, but to ensure that at all times, pandemic or no pandemic, people with life-limiting conditions can gain access to high quality palliative care when and where they need it. Way back in April, The Lancet published a commentary that said in very blunt terms that palliative care was under-resourced at the best of times. But these are not the best of times. It concluded by saying, and I quote, a pandemic is a cause and powerful amplifier of suffering through physical illness and death, through stresses and anxieties, and through financial and social instability. Alleviation of that suffering in all its forms needs to be a key part of the pandemic response. That remains as true today as it was at the beginning of the pandemic. As it has done for the past 29 years, PCA will continue to advocate for and promote quality palliative care for all who need it. For more resources and information, I encourage you to visit the PCA website, palliativecare.org.au, and engage with us on Facebook and Twitter. Until our next Parliamentary Friends event, please stay safe and have a wonderful COVID-free Christmas.